Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from thousands of successful individuals from around the world. I am your host, Ashutosh Garg, and today I'm privileged to welcome a very distinguished and accomplished professional and diplomat from New York, USA, Mr. Kenneth Ian Jasta. Ken, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's nice to be here. Thank you. Ken is a former United States ambassador to India for the period 2017 to 2021. Um, he's also a distinguished fellow at the Council on For Foreign Relations. So Ken, before we talk about India and USA, which you've had a major role in shaping, tell me about your own journey, you know, from the corporate world to becoming a diplomat. Well, thank you. I've been very fortunate in my career to be able to do a combination of law and international law, yeah. uh, serve in and out of the U.S. government in a variety of international positions, mm -hmm. uh, work in the technology sector, and work uh, in uh, finance. I began my training as a, a lawyer. Uh, I uh, practiced international law at one of the major law firms in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. But I also was able to go into government initially uh, as the deputy and senior advisor to Deputy Secretary of State Lawrence Siegelberger and was uh, working with him and Secretary of State uh, James Baker mm -hmm. as the Cold War ended, uh, putting together the uh, uh, coalition to eject uh, Iraq from Kuwait, mm -hmm. uh, managing the disintegration of the Soviet Union and uh, so much more. Uh, I then practiced again international law for a number, number of years before becoming Under Secretary of Commerce. Mm. That's when I first got involved with the U.S.-India relationship on a governmental level uh, in 2001 when India and the United States began to transform the relationship and India wanted greater access to U.S. technology, something Correct. that continues to today. Correct. And we created the High Technology Cooperation Group and worked our way up through a variety of uh, exchanges. Mm -hmm. uh, later, I joined a technology company named Salesforce and was involved in the software and technology yeah. sector, which was an incredible uh, learning experience and uh, helped open our India office for Salesforce, uh, and then moved to finance and worked with a wonderful private equity firm named Warburg Pincus yeah. before being tapped uh, in 2017 to go to the White House and be in charge of international economic affairs at both the National Security Council, the National Economic Council, and shortly thereafter was nominated to become the U.S. Ambassador to India. So I've been very fortunate to work in a range of uh, industries and sectors, and in many respects, being the Ambassador to India brought everything together in a cohesive and coherent way. Fascinating. What an amazing journey. Uh, can you also received the U.S.-India Business Council's Blackwell Award for your contributions to U.S.-India relations. And you said you got involved with India in 2001. What motivated you to focus on India? Well, I actually first became interested in India in the mid-60s when my parents took a international trip mm -hmm. for 30 days. Remember, this was like 1966. Mm -hmm. They went all throughout uh, Asia, uh, in the Middle East and Europe, and spent several days in India. And my father, who was an architect, would take numerous uh, uh, photographs and, in the form of slides. And I saw all these fascinating slides of India. Mm. Then in college, uh, as a freshman uh, at orientation, the first lecture was from John Kenneth Galbraith. And mm -hmm. he spoke eloquently of his tenure as the U.S. ambassador. Mm. And then we had a later lecture in orientation week from Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who only a few months after that was named the U.S. ambassador to India. So somehow mm. I think there was a message there for me. Uh, and when I was under Secretary of Commerce in charge of industry and security issues, including mm. sense of technology, we worked out a way to continue to take Indian entities off of the sanctions list that had resulted from the 1998 mm. nuclear tests and to grant them increased access to dual-use technology, technology mm. that has both military and civilian use, in exchange for India developing uh, tighter export controls and having the safeguards so that technology transferred to an Indian uh, entity, we would know 
that it was being used by that entity for the specified purpose. Mm -hmm. And that then led to a next steps and strategic partnership initiative for cooperation and civil defense and civil nuclear matters and high technology and civil space matters. Ultimately, that was followed by the civil nuclear deal. And the relationship has been on a upward trajectory for the last 20 plus years. And so I've been privileged to be a part of that. And it's been one of the most gratifying uh, things of my life. Amazing. And of course, you know, we've just had this amazing trip that has just been concluded between Prime Minister Modi and President Biden. Uh, but what would you describe as the state of the U.S.-India relations during your time and how has it evolved since then? Well, as I indicated, I think the relationship was truly transformed in 2001 forward and it's been on a, uh, a positive trajectory since then and has widened to include virtually every issue of human endeavor that we interact mm -hmm. on, whether it's defense, counterterrorism, nonproliferation, right. trade investment, energy, the environment, space, oceans, science and technology, education, agriculture, health. Mm -hmm. I could go on and on. And we've deepened the relationship over time as well. During my uh, tenure, we revived the Quad, which is a grouping of uh, yeah. India, the United States, Japan, and Australia. It had formed briefly in 2007, but ceased operations in 2008, but we revived it in 2017. And that's taken off and have been very successful as a unique grouping of those four countries, uh, three of whom are tree allies, one of which India is a strategic partner. Mm -hmm. We developed a two plus two dialogue of uh, defense and uh, foreign ministers that has become a key strategic uh, forum for the United States and India. Mm -hmm. And we expanded our energy relationship and uh, played a key role in uh, exporting all forms of energy to India. Uh, we worked together on a range of defense issues that increased the complexity of our military exercises. Uh, we expanded them to further include further country, other countries. Mm -hmm. uh, we also had exchanges of military personnel. Uh, we concluded after many years of negotiation what are known as foundational agreements for sharing logistics for sharing geospatial information, for secure communications, and for industrial cooperation. Uh, and we increased the sales, which had been virtually zero mm -hmm. uh, in 2001, uh, to over $20 billion uh, today. And then that's going to be increased by what was announced at the recent visit mm -hmm. of military equipment from the United States uh, to India. So it's been a, a broad uh, expansion of the relationship in many areas, hmm. uh, defense and technology, two of them, and that was highlighted in the state visit last week, of Prime okay. Minister Modi. Correct. Well said. Thank you. And, uh, you know, you spoke a little bit about uh, the defense uh, purchase purchases. Hmm. How have you seen the U.S.-India defense partnership progress? And what are some of the primary areas of cooperation that you see going forward? Well, what is interesting is, as I indicated, the United States and India are not allies. They are strategic partners. Correct. And so the defense relationship is not something that happens automatically. It's had to expand over time as each side has become more comfortable with each other. We now, in the Quad, uh, coordinate uh, extensively on maritime domain awareness. As I said, we've increased the level of military sales uh, now we announced uh, last week that we will be transferring some significant manufacturing technologies, mm -hmm. like General uh, Electric and yep. the uh, production of uh, jet engines for right. fighter aircraft. And those mm -hmm. will now be co-produced uh, in India. Uh, we are selling uh, armed drones to India. And so this has expanded significantly. But again, we have to remember it's not an alliance mm -hmm. and it's not clear how much operational coordination there would ever be in, in, in a conflict, uh, but there will be increased uh, interaction and uh, potential interoperability of equipment. And so I see that relationship continuing to grow and expand as the levels of confidence and comfort mm -hmm. uh, uh, mm -hmm. as they have over time. Yep. Well said. Thank you. 
Can you also speak about uh, the role of the U.S.-India Strategic Partnership Forum and how it has influenced the relationship between USA and India? Well, the U.S.-India Strategic Partnership Forum formerly was the U.S.-India Business Council, and then mm. for a variety of reasons, it uh, morphed into a new organization. Mm. And uh, they have been very instrumental in advancing the relationship. I I first worked with them when I was under Secretary of Commerce when U.S.-India relations were not as popular as they are today. Mm -hmm. But it's often been the business community that has uh, uh, given further ballast to the relationship. There are now over 2,000 American companies operating in India. Mm -hmm. And the U.S.-India Business Council brings businessmen together to figure out how can we facilitate trade and investment, how can we enhance our economic partnership, uh, and they have access to the political leadership at the highest levels in both countries and are mm. often able to advance uh, the relationship, which exists not just on a business to business relation uh, level, but also mm. a people to people level. And of course, the government to government level mm. and all 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 of those levels are operating uh, on all cylinders these mm. days. Well said. But uh, Ken, the other question that I have is that while there is a tremendous amount of bonhomie and uh, you know backslapping and and a great strategic partnership what do you see as some, some of the challenges well as i mentioned a moment ago uh we're not allies and so uh and in some ways india may have ultimately a different strategic vision for world order than the united states india believes in a multipolar uh world system in which some of those polls might be countries that the United States doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily uh, think uh, should be polls in the world system. Mm -hmm. The United States uh, has backed more of a liberal-led world order that uh, is based on a series of institutions developed after World War II that we recognize need to be reformed, but mm -hmm. our idea of the reforms in India's might not be exactly uh, the same. So there, at a strategic level, are some challenges. And economically, while our economic relationship has continued to grow and expand mm -hmm. in terms of levels of trade, which when I first was under secretary, bilateral trade, goods and services was about $19 billion. Today, it's about $190 billion. Wow. It's mm -hmm. grown, but for the world's largest economy, the United States, and the fifth largest economy, India, I don't feel it fulfills its potential. And so right. that's a challenge especially because China has a robust regional trade strategy. Mm -hmm. It has uh, uh, extensive trade relations with virtually every country mm -hmm. in Asia. Mm -hmm. It has joined uh, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, which India withdrew from. It has mm -hmm. applied for the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement on Trans-Pacific Partnership, which the mm -hmm. United States withdrew from. Uh, it, it sponsors the Belt and Road Initiative. So the United States and India really need to come together Correct. for a more robust economic uh, and regional strategy. Mm -hmm. The U.S. has put forward something called the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, right. but it remains to be seen whether this will meet the challenge. Mm -hmm. And, you know, your response gives me a segue to my next question, which is that given the influence of China in the region, how do you see the U.S.-India strategic partnership evolving? Well, when this relationship began to be transformed in 2001, both the United States and India had workable relations with China. Mm -hmm. And so China and hedging against a uh, potential rise of China may have been one factor in uh, transforming the relationship. It was not a central factor. Mm -hmm. And yet in more recent years, the rise of China has given pause to both the United States and India and raised concerns, mm -hmm. and especially acutely for India after the uh, tragic events of 2020, when the Chinese uh, started to uh, make incursions on the northern border mm -hmm. with India, and ultimately in June of 2020, killed 20 Indian troops, the first casualties yeah. in 45 years mm -hmm. on that border. So there's now greater strategic clarity uh, between the United States and India on the challenges raised by China's rise. And this has given further impetus 
to the strategic partnership, especially in the area of defense cooperation and uh, technology, but just more broadly uh, as well. Neither side wants to have a conflict with China. They're not looking to uh, work against China, but what they want to do is create a positive architecture for the Indo-Pacific right. region that advances their values and interests and promotes stability mm. and prosperity. Mm. Wonderful. And one of the things that has often been spoken about and uh, was highlighted again in the recent visit was the importance of people-to-people -people ties between the U.S. and India. I mean, Indians have been working in the U.S. for the last 100 years, if I can say. What would you say is the importance of this people-to-people -people, um, communication and ties, and how will that influence the relationships between the countries? Well, this part of the relationship has also grown in leaps and bounds. So if you go back to the 80s or 90s, 1980, 1990, there were Indians, Americans in the United States, but not at the levels we've seen today. And the growth has been exponential to the point that we have over 4 million Indian Americans in the United States. We have mm. several hundred thousand Indian students studying in the United States. Uh, we have almost a million American citizens living in India, often the children of Indian couples when they were living in the United States. Mm. And this provides an underlying foundation and glue to the partnership that doesn't exist in many relationships, because mm. not only are Indian Americans living in the United States in large numbers, but they contribute tremendously to our uh, mm. society. And so I think this is a factor that will add to the uh, strategic importance of the relationship and draw us, continually draw us closer together. So it's a very important component of the relationship and one that has a very positive impact on mm political uh, relationship more mm. broadly. Mm. Very interesting. My next question is on the free trade agreement. And I remember uh, when you were the ambassador, there was a lot of discussion that it could be happening any any day, so to speak. What is holding back the FTA? Well, regrettably, what has happened today is that trade is a less popular uh, topic Mm. for domestic political reasons. Mm. I think uh, both the United States and India in the political sphere feel that trade has disadvantaged uh, portions of their society, has hollowed out their manufacturing capabilities. And so there's a reluctance to think about trade and some of the very positive elements that it provides in terms of economic growth, consumer opportunity, and jobs. Mm. Uh, uh, even though uh, it creates some uh, shifts in uh, the domestic economic situation. Mm -hmm. So I think it's unlikely that we're going to see any type of free trade agreement in the near future. Mm -hmm. But I do think there are efforts being made, and some of them were announced last week, mm -hmm. by the United States and India to work through some of their trade frictions and to mm -hmm. at least develop mechanisms for increasing trade, whether it be in agricultural areas or others to resolve disputes that exist at the World Trade Organization, mm. and overall to continue to have the trade and investment relationship grow, even if, in my opinion, it's not reaching its full potential. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Uh, and what, in your view, are some of the areas where more work needs to be done between the two countries? Well, as I said, I think, I think in the economic area, mm. uh, there could be more work, and especially regionally, because in many respects, that's the major playing arena that China occupies, and that's mm -hmm. important to countries in the Indo-Pacific region, especially in Southeast Asia and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And so the United States and India really need to work together on a uh, regional trade strategy, as mm -hmm. I indicated. There's the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, yeah, right. the trade pillar, but we have to see where that goes. And then mm. I, I think the other area will be to see how, how far they can go in their defense and strategic cooperation, given mm. that uh, India is not an ally of the United States or any other country and has a strong desire, uh, at least at this point in time, to maintain an independent and strategically autonomous foreign mm. policy. Mm. And how do we uh, accommodate that at the same time that we try to broaden our relationships and some of this became apparent uh, with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, where Correct. India takes a different position than the United States. Mm -hmm. Well said. 
I have time for two more questions for you. So I'm going to come back to your term uh, as the U.S. ambassador. Could you share with me some of the highlights of your tenure and some memorable moments? Sure. Uh, first of all, it was a extraordinary experience for me and the highlight of my personal and professional mm -hmm. uh, career. Uh, uh, and the warmth of the people in India, the relationships you develop mm -hmm. uh, were uh, really uh, heartwarming and very meaningful to me. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned, we made substantial progress in the defense relationship and the economic and energy relationship and health. We coordinated. There were three crises in particular that uh, I uh, remember well. Mm -hmm. uh, one was when there was a terrorist incident, cross-border terrorism yeah. from Pakistan and Pulwama mm -hmm. in February of 2019, and then mm -hmm. the Indian response in Balakot. And uh, this led to some concerns about a nuclear exchange between mm -hmm. India and Pakistan. And mm -hmm. I was proud and pleased of the role the United States was able to play to help quell those concerns mm -hmm. and keep things uh, moving forward without any sort of nuclear uh, action uh, mm -hmm. by either side. Mm -hmm. uh, second, the cooperation that we uh, undertook during COVID, uh, which uh, was a pandemic and crisis that uh, none of us had ever experienced uh, previously. Uh, India was in a strict lockdown. We mm -hmm. worked successfully to repatriate close to 6,000 Americans from the yeah. United States, from India to the United States. We, mm -hmm opened up essential businesses. We were able to keep medical supplies moving. So there were a lot of things that we did together, again, mm -hmm. that I'm very proud of. And then finally, as I mentioned earlier, when China uh, in 2020 uh, suddenly moved from doing military exercises in Tibet to moving across the undefined mm -hmm. border with India, but in, in terms of uh, in territory that was previously not viewed as Chinese, mm -hmm. uh, we, I think, were extremely supportive of India and did a variety of things in terms mm -hmm. of information sharing, providing uh, equipment and gear for the high altitude in mm -hmm. winter, uh, leasing drones to them. And again, that was a crisis that I feel we worked through very well. And mm -hmm. All of these are built on the strong personal relationships that uh, I feel I was able to yeah. develop over 20 plus years with my mm. Indian counterparts and mm. the level of trust uh, and and uh, comfort working with each other that uh, mm. good results. Amazing. And my last question to you, uh, Ken, and this is about your Justa Fellowships. Tell me a little bit more about the Justa Fellowships and your motivation to offer these. Thank you. Well, I have uh, started uh, fellowships for students at Harvard College uh, at Harvard Law School and at the mm -hmm. Harvard County School of Government, all of which I was fortunate to attend. And I was the beneficiary of fellowships when I was a student. I mm -hmm. received a grant from Harvard Center for International Affairs between my junior and senior years to mm -hmm. do research in Japan uh, for my senior thesis under uh, a well-known professor, Edwin O. Reichauer. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was at the law school in the Kennedy School, I received funding to work at the National Security Council with a professor who had been a research assistant for in college named Samuel Huntington. This was mm -hmm. during the Carter administration. And those experiences living in Japan, as well as uh, working in Washington at the White House and the National Security Council had a tremendous impact on me and uh, were hugely influential in my growth and my career and what I've done in my life. And mm -hmm. so, when I had the opportunity financially to be able to give back, I wanted to do that for students and I've created these fellowships and I'm delighted that every year we have five to six fellows from each of the schools and I meet with them each year and uh, it's very gratifying to hear about what they're doing and to stay in touch with many of them uh, over time. So uh, they say you give forward or you should give back and uh, that's what I try to do, and I'm very pleased that I have, and it's mm -hmm. a very gratifying experience. Amazing. And on that note, uh, Ken, uh, thank you so much for speaking to me about your own amazing journey. Thank you for speaking to me at such length about India-U.S. relations. And as we were talking before we, <laughs> we started recording, this conversation could have gone on for several hours, but I had to 
somehow or the other stop myself from asking you questions on questions. But I think this is a great opportunity for me and my viewers to have learned something straight from you as you, because you were in the, the, the so-called hot seat between 2017 and 2021. Thank you also for speaking to me about what is going to be involved in making these uh, relationships between the two countries much stronger. And uh, thank you for talking to me about the Justa Fellowships. Thank you thank again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ashutosh. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience, and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website, www.tbcy.in, to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.